You know, that is not the song that I thought I had picked out. <laughs> I apologize. That was a dumb song. I mean, it wasn't a dumb song, but it's not suitable, I guess, for our purposes. <laughs> so I'm Laura. This is uh, Stuff I Find Interesting. This is a special edition. This is Art Part 2. So we're going over the Greatest Paintings of All Time. It's a book. Um, I think it's a thousand and one painting, so it's a lot of paintings. And someone has put together a compilation of some of those paintings, and I don't know which, which one, so we're just going to look at them together, and we're going to talk about them. But before I do, I just want to talk about something very quickly, and that is art therapy, how the brain is affected by art. So your brain, when you look at art, does stuff especially if it's art that you like. So if it's art that you like, it lowers cortisol levels and it improves focus. It can help you process emotions, help you imagine a more hopeful future, and improve communication skills. You might say, eh. <clears throat> no, it's true. It's true. I can tell you it's true. <laughs> there is increasing evidence in the rehabilitation medicine and field of neuroscience that art enhances brain function by impacting brainwave patterns, emotions, and the nervous system. Art can also raise serotonin levels. These benefits don't just come from making art, they also occur by experiencing art. Observing art can stimulate the creation of new neural pathways and ways of thinking, which is one of the reasons why I do what I do, is to help you think of things maybe in a new way, perhaps. Some more articles, these will be in the links, you can read them. Uh, feeling artsy, here's how making art helps your brain. So that's about the creating of art. This is how looking at art. Uh, so, uh, it talks about embodied cognition, mirror neurons in the brain, turn things like action, movement, and energy you see in art into actual emotions you can feel. Embodied cognition starts when you look at a piece of art. The more you analyze the piece, the more you place yourself within the scene and can actually feel the quality of the works. For instance, viewers of a drip painting by Jackson Pollock can often feel like they are the ones flinging the paint onto the canvas. Other art, such as piece depicting a desert landscape, can make you feel the effects of the hot sun, the sand beneath your feet, the sound of a soft breeze. When you feel embodied cognition, you're able to appreciate the artwork even more. It talks about how to effectively view art. I, I don't know. You view it the way you want to view it. This is where I... Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> I'll look at it the way I want to. All right, art in the brain. So this is neuro... Psychology, this is written by someone with a um, doctorate. Uh, for a minute, I got scared and thought his name was something else. It's J. Annat, Annat, J. Annat. But it discusses what happens in the brain and symbolic thought and communication systems and everything. And, you know, this isn't just relegated, I think, to looking at art. It's also listening to music. I think listening to music also does stuff to the brain. And I would encourage everybody, at least once a week, to listen to music that you've never heard before. It helps. I don't know what it does, right? It just helps. Unless you hate music and you don't like listening to stuff. And there are people that, that are like that. They just, they like the quiet. They need the quiet. So for you guys, don't check it out. Uh, okay, we're not going to go into this. You know what? We're, we're going to go straight to the art. Straight, straight to the art. Give it to me straight from the art. <laughs> that was terrible. Okay, this is where we stopped last time. J.M.W. Turner. Um, we talked about how he started out painting very realistic, and then at the end of his career, he started getting more luministic. I'm not even sure what to call this, actually, but more like this. And... Not everybody liked it. Some people were like, ah, you can't even tell it's a bridge. Ah, you can't even see the people's faces. You know, tradition. This is the burning of the House of Lords and Commons, October 16th, 1834. This was a real event that, that happened. Okay, first painting up. 
Danish Artists at the Osteria La Gensola in Rome by Ditlieve Blunk. You know, I've never seen this painting before, but I got to say that this guy looks like he's thoroughly done with this waiter, whatever's going on with this waiter. He's like, yeah, 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 whatever. And this guy's saying, this isn't what I wanted. At least that it would appear that way. And this guy's looking out over here. Uh, we got some dude killing time over here. Some kids, some cats, a dog. Look at how nice the fur is rendered. A little baby. But let me bring your attention to the um, the lemons coming in through the window. Um, the the reflection off of this bottle that's up here. So even though it's kind of exaggerated just a little bit, um, it's beautifully done. It's a very, very, very wonderful piece. I like it a lot. Um, this is day. I already read that, and it doesn't have anything else about it. So moving on to the next one. Hopefully it's something good. Oh, American Lake Scene by Thomas Cole. 1844 from the collection of the Detroit Institute of Arts. <clears throat> Despite his English birth, Thomas Cole became one of the greatest landscape painters of the 19th century. Having emigrated to America in 1818, the young Cole found himself enamored by the beauty of the o Ohio countryside. In 1825, Cole executed a series of paintings along New York's Hudson River that were to make his fortune. There's some more stuff that you can read. So the Hudson River School was a romantic um, a romantic movement where everything was sort of por portrayed romantic, perhaps even a little gothic. Like this one gives me kind of e echoes of um, uh, Friedrich. What's his face? Oh my God, he's in there some. He's in here somewhere. I guarantee you, uh, Friedrich, Casper Friedrich, I think. Anyhow, this is not my favorite work by him. I'm confused as to why they would include this one. I mean, he does. These huge, sweeping, panoramic things. Um, usually he puts a person in there. Let's see if we can find the person. Yep, there's the person. Um, every single painting, he's got a little person in it. I'm guessing it's him. I'm not really sure. All right, next we have The Balcony Room by Adolf Menzel, 1845. It's just pretty. You got the light coming in through the window, right? Feels like morning. I'd say, um, maybe late in the morning, you overslept, you look out, you see the, the light coming in through the, the sheer curtains, you smell the coolness of the breeze. Not much else to say about that. Now, this is the Con Comtesse de Hausenville. Jean-Auguste Domique Ingres. Oh, I know who that is. From the collection of the Frick Collection. Like, what's the Frick? This is the Frick. Those colors are banging. I gotta say, I love that dress. The color is like, what would you say? Like periwinkle? Then we've got this deep blue. I'll have to look up who she is when I do the recap. Um, because she's very interesting. Let's Let's go in a little closer. Okay, so we're all the way in, and just wow, right? We can see she has a comb in her hair. He's painted the back. You can see there's like a little fastening going on there. Um, we can see what looks to be some sort of bureau, uh, but it doesn't look like her bedroom. Oh, here it is. She was the granddaughter of Madame de Steele, married at the age of 18. Her husband was a diplomat, writer, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and she wrote a bunch of books, and she was um, outspoken, independent, and liberal. So that's that's probably why he um, why he posed her like this. Because typically it was more you posed. It wasn't you know it wasn't it wasn't like casual. You had to like be pro pro professional with it, I guess. Oh, this is a fun one. This is Isabella by Jean, uh, uh, John Everett Malaise, who painted a lot of stuff. One of my favorites, for sure. And this one is one where the color just pops. Um, what did I hit? What happened? No. Gosh dang it. 
What did I do? Guys, oh, I messed up. Okay, let's try something. Let's go back up and let's hit refresh. Okay, oh, of course, of course it, it defaults to the naked woman. Right? Okay, cool. All right, we survived. We're okay. I was a little upset there for a minute. I was trying to make it smaller so you could see, but I think I'm going to leave it. You can you can go back and look at it if you want. Uh, so we see we have this guy. He's got his foot out because he's kicking at the dog. He, we can see the dog's body language. He's kind of pulling away. There's another dog under the chair. There's what looks to be a bird of prey who's eating too, which is kind of neat. So the bird's eating. There's a guy looking very... Um, very proper. This guy we can tell is is drinking very enthusiastically. And there's this guy who has a very interesting face. I think he might be my favorite in all of this. So look at that. That's There's something going on there, right? She's taking an orange. And the old woman's kind of going, mm, I don't know about this. And if we look, this woman has a little bit of sweat running down her face, probably because she's hot because everybody's all crammed together, right? Um, this is... This was Malay's first painting in the new, sharply detailed Pre-Raphaelite style. The bright color, the flattening of the picture space, and the deliberate stiffness and angularity of the figures were all features taken from early Italian painting. The story is also told through clear gestures and facial expressions. He's also included symbolic details such as the hawk tearing at a feather. Okay, so it's not food. The blood orange given to Isabella and the passion flower above her head. Ooh la la intrigue this is the sower by J john francis Millet. um he's the one that painted the the couple it's sunset and they're in the field and they've got their their tools and they're sort of bowing their head in prayer that's that's the same guy i think we're going to double check that but i'm pretty sure it's the same guy Washington Crossing the Delaware, Emanuel Lutz, 1851, from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I've seen this, and it's quite large, quite large. And it's, I mean, we've seen this so much, right, in history books and stuff that we forget how well this is, this is painted. Um, oh, and it looks like that's as far as I can go. Some paintings don't allow you to go any further. I don't know why that is. I said we have John William Waterhouse. Um, oh, no, this is also Sir. No, wait. Is that Sir John? I thought that was Waterhouse. Hmm. We're going to double check that. Yeah, by Ophelia, by John Waterhouse. They're wrong. I found a mistake. They're just testing me. So that is Ophelia, and Ophelia has this story, and Ophelia has just drowned herself. John Waterhouse, um, much like Sir Edwin Landseer, the guy with the dog, was considered overly sentimental and that he he painted like like his stuff was just like too pretty you know it was too pretty to be worthy of artistic um uh credit or awards or anything like that uh but looking at his paintings when you look at his paintings close up you can see the incredible uh detail that he put into everything and Nobody painted hands like him. Like, he was so good at painting hands and expressions. And he painted a lot of redheads. He painted a lot of redheads. But that was common for the time. And I don't think he used uh, Ms. Siddons, who we talked about the last episode, I think. Um, <clears throat> but he might have. I'll look into that. The Awakening Conscience by William Holman Hunt. 
So here's this guy, and he's like, hey, come on, why don't you just sit down? I, You know, come on. And she's like, you could see by her hands, like, see her hands are are all kind of jammed up. She's like, mm, you know, it shows like I shouldn't be doing this. But let's look at her face. She doesn't look like she's not into it. She looks more like she needs to not be into it for whatever reason. Her age, her situation, her just the proper improperness of it, you know, just sitting on some guy's lap while he plays the piano is probably not considered proper at that time. Here it is. This is the painting I was talking about. Um, there's the tool, and they're praying in the field. The sun has gone down. Um, they're praying for a, a good harvest. Now, this particular picture, Salvador Dali loved this painting. Uh, he had copies of it in his house, and he put it into his paintings. I'll show you next time what he did, but he was very inspired by this. Now, we think of Sal Salvador Dali, we think of like, oh, it's that you know weird guy who painted like the lips and the melting clocks. But Salvador Dali was a master. I mean, an absolute, he was brilliant. And I don't even like his stuff, honestly. I don't. There's a couple of things I like, but he's not my thing. But he's brilliant, incredible. Northeast view from the top of Mount Kosciusko by Ed Eugene von Gerard. So this would go back to the, uh, the flat sort of uh, prints that would come out that would show travel to areas that people hadn't been familiar with before. So this was probably... Um, this was around the time right before photography kind of really hit because it was after, after the Civil War, um, pretty much everywhere, not just, not just in America. Um, so if we look at this, we've got little people down here. I like looking at the little people. He's saying, oh, look, it's over there. These guys that climbed mountains back in the day and, and discovered new places, they were so incredible, like I mean, you know, with just like some pemmican, which is like a this, it's like dried meat, and like I think there's cornmeal in there, and maybe some fruits, but it gets all sort of like jammed together, and it's like 3,500 calories, and it makes a brick, and you put it in your pocket, and you chew off pieces of it, and that's what some of these guys lived on, and in fact, Robert Peary, who was the guy who discovered the South Pole, I believe, loved it. He loved pemmican. He, he talked about it, how much, how much he loved it, uh, which was interesting. So this particular pic picture shows German scientist George Neumeyer, who is studying terrestrial magnetism and conducting a survey of Victoria. So he's just going to the top of the mountain to study magnetism, you know, as one does. <laughs> this is uh, Luncheon on the Grass, uh, Sir La Dejeuner. I don't remember what is it, it is in French, but the title is actually in French, not in American, but they put it in American. So this, this picture caused a little bit of a flap for obvious reasons, and um, I don't know. That's Olympia also caused, um, caused some consternation amongst the more conservative of folks. Orpheus, looks like she's got Orpheus's head. I don't remember why she's holding Orpheus's head. I don't remember. This is uh, the, probably the artist family. No, this is another. Uh, the Bellelli family by Edgar Degas. Oh, so Degas is the guy who painted all the ballerinas. And this painting is like a totally different thing than what he normally did. I mean, you could see in the sort of the haziness of it um, and the expression of this girl here, you can sort of recognize his work. But this feels a little bit different, I would say. And I've, I've actually never seen this before. So this is interesting to me. I'm definitely going to have to check that out a little more. This is Niagara Falls. Let me guess. Let me see if I can guess who this is by. Um, I have no idea. Oh, wow. This is a big one. I've never seen that one either. Oh, it is by Frederick Edwin Church. No freaking sh wow. I got goosebumps, guys. 
I've never seen this one before. I've seen the other one with Niagara Falls. So he did the famous one with Niagara Falls where you just sort of see the precipice and you see it drop off and you see the foam in the water and it's very bleh. This one is more kind of like romantic. I mean, you see the falls and obviously it's like, uh, but the, there's this land down here. Um, that's freaking stunning, man. Church did not put people in his paintings. So Church had a house named Olana, which is in Columbia County, New York. And it's about an hour and a half that way. This way is north. But for you people watching, it'd be that way. Although if you're watching, you might be facing any number of directions. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's a beautiful place. You can go on tours there and have a picnic and stuff. It's, it's, it's quite it's quite nice. Oh, look, there is a person there. No shit. This day is full of exciting things. Yep, there's a little person there. Hmm. Two persons. Wow, that's exciting. That's really exciting, guys. Wow. Okay, moving on. <laughs> This is the studio at Le Batignolles Henri Fantin Lafour, and these are the other artists that were at the Musée, I think it was the Musée de Paris, but it was like where painters went to learn, but painters of a certain style. So actually there's painters here that are famous, and I'll have to look up which ones, which ones they are because I, I don't remember. But if I said their names, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I know that guy. I know that guy. I know that guy. Like, you might not know them, but you'll recognize their name because they're part of popular uh, popular culture. And you see their stuff a lot. Look how well the shoes are done. Like, it's just fantastic. But these guys used to, like, just go in the studio and hang out. And then, you know, you'd have the ladies that, that I was talking about who just made a living by posing. So there'd be these dudes kind of milling about. Maybe there'd be a naked lady in the center kind of posing but it was it was people that paint the human body in an uninhibited way do not see a problem with seeing a naked body they're like oh yeah it's a naked body so it, I th it's a little bit different it's it's not like you know I don't know how to explain it lady with a squirrel and a starling oh yeah there's the starling and Lovell with a question mark Hans Holbein the younger oh we talked about him before and she looks, um, she looks a little bit like my mom, actually. I like squirrels very much. I once spent an entire winter taming squirrels and birds. That was like my goal. Um, and on the weekends, I would go out and I would sit in the snow and I would put, um, like I would sit on something and then I would put bird seed all over me and all around me and I would prop my elbows up, my arms on things like this so that the birds could come and land. Um, it was neat. I probably told that story before, but it was like probably the only <laughs> happy memory from my childhood. This is another salon picture. This is Basile's uh, studio um, from the Musée d'Orsay. This is another guy who was part of that club. This is Whistler, um, portrait of the artist's mother. This is a very famous painting. Uh, as you can see, she's very stern. This is one of his works on the wall. Um, a very drab palette, but it works. Kind of like Wyeth, the, the guy who painted Christina's World, the woman who's sort of like crawling across the field. Um, Wyeth, he painted with sort of a, a similar kind of palette, it feels like to me. This is self-portrait with death playing the fiddle. This is Arnold Bocklin, 1872. And this is really just about, you know, he's he's drawing a self-portrait, but the part the I guess the part the point I want to make is that he painted a lot of portraits of himself. So in this particular portrait, he's older and he's looking at himself and he's feeling kind of death on his shoulder because for the first time he's saying oh you know I'm not young anymore I'm older you know I could die I could catch tuberculosis or whatever and look how delicate his hand is with the paintbrush how nice that is he's just just beautiful 
And death is like, yeah, I'm going to take you away. This is in a cafe. This is also Edgar Degas. And this is a woman drinking absinthe. So she's drinking absinthe and she's probably tripping a little bit. She's probably staring at the patterns on the walls and just sort of zoning out. This is Picnic in May. Eh, I don't know. I'm kind of mad this is here. I, I wouldn't call this the, in the thousand and one best paintings. Look at that. Look at the way he's, he's, he's leaning down. People don't lean down that way. He would fall over. This is dumb. I hate that painting. This is, the, uh, this is what you're familiar with when it comes to Degas. Now, everybody thinks when it comes to Degas that his stuff is romantic and should be viewed in like a, like, oh, look at the ballerinas. They're dancing. They're so beautiful. They're so whatever. But if you take a closer look at his stuff, you'll see that what he's really portraying is the world of the ballerinas. And in a lot of cases, he's showing their fatigue, um, you know, their, the fact that they were sort of kind of taken advantage of and not really paid very well. They were expected to perform. It shows their where their class is in society because it would show men sort of, you know, over them. Um, not all of his paintings, but if you, if, you, if you just Google Degas and look at the images, you'll see some of what I'm talking about. This is Nocturne in Black and Gold by James Whistler. So Whistler painted his mum, but he also painted this. So you might say, well, what the frick is that? So this is the, uh, the coastline. Um, and this is reflection on the coast. This is a boat, it looks like. And then behind it, you have buildings. Those are buildings. So that's what it is. But it's abstracted. You know, it's abstracted. He got abstract at the end, too, just like J.M.W. Turner. And I think that's what happens. Picasso did the same thing. He started out doing very realistic paintings. And then he started painting people looking all blocky and stuff. This is Red Roof's Camille Pizarro. Why would they choose that one by Pizarro? So weird. Eh, it's, it's kind of what they call an impasto technique where you just sort of lob the paint on and, and sort of do this. And some people are into that. I kind of think it's a waste of paint. This is uh, Renoir, Luncheon of the Boating Party. You've probably seen this one before. This is a fairly famous one. Sick Girl by Christian Krog. I have not seen this one either. She looks very sad. So the symbolism here, I believe, if I'm reading this right, and I'll go back and look up all this stuff for part two, is the rose is losing its leaves and it looks wilted, which means it doesn't look good for her, that she's dying. That's what I think. This is, let me see if I can guess. Uh, uh, it's not Blake. It's, I don't know. Ernst Josephson. I did not know that. That's water sprite. I, I don't know, not really weird. This is a famous one that you've probably seen before. This is by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And this is Prosepony. And Prosepony has the pomegranate. This is one of those myths. Um, I believe she's the one that was underground for six months out of the year or something. I'm not sure. But look at how beautiful she is. This is uh, one of those models I was talking about who uh, modeled for like everybody. Um, but she ended up with Rossetti. In fact, I think they either had an affair or they got married. Part of the fun too in looking up art is looking up the personal lives of the artists because artists live very messy lives. This is called Pontalism and that's dot, 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 dot. <laughs> Sorry. Banging on the wall. A Sunday on a Lan Grand Jate by George Surratt. So this is this is what Surratt did. And it's supposed to kind of give you the feeling of sort of a hazy day, like you're there and you're kind of experiencing that feeling you get when you go to the beach and it's like a Sunday afternoon and people are sitting down. 
That's how I interpret it. I could be totally wrong. Be, but look, there, there's a damn monkey on a leash. I don't know that I've ever noticed that before. This guy's smoking something. He looks real chill. This is Summer Night by Kitty Keeland. This is at the National Museum of Art. Here we have a pond. Um, I did a kayak thing once in a very beautiful pond that had these sort of channels. So there was one lake and there were these channels that you could kayak through and then it led to another lake that was just very kind of quiet and peaceful and there was nothing around. And it was so magical, you know, going past the lily pads and then going into the little channel and there's dragonflies landing on you. Wonderful thing. Um, I can't think of this guy's name. Edward Byrne Jones, that's it. That's the guy who I thought was the other guy. I said, the one I thought was, I said, was not Blake. I thought it was this guy. Because you could see the style is kind of, kind of familiar. I don't really like his stuff. I don't know. There's an energy to it that's kind of weird. But that's the thing about art. What strikes me as beautiful might not strike you as beautiful. What strikes you as beautiful. I mean, it's very um, personal. <clears throat> and you enter into a conversation with that painting in a personal way, whether you like it or dislike it. Um, you have to look at it for more than a second, though, in order for that conversation to happen. Well, we know who this is. This is Van Gogh. This is his room. Um, those colors are pow. This is John Singer Sargent. Ah, it is. Isabella Stewart Gardner with a very small waist, apparently. Um, that's a cool background. Another Van Gogh. This is the wheat field with crows. These are the crows. <laughs> when I first saw Van, when I saw Van Gogh in a book, I was like, yeah, whatever, no big deal. And, but then I saw Van Gogh in person and there's a tactileness to his work that's hard to put into words that makes the painting truly a work of art like you look at this and you say oh he just kind of went crazy with a bunch of paintbrushes right and he did but it, it's more than that you kind of have to see it in person uh, it's it, it, wonderful <laughs> here we have a cowboy by tom roberts this is 19, 1891 this is the punishment of lust by giovanni sargentini 1891 Hmm. I'm going to have to look that one up. I've never seen this one. And look, there's other ladies over there kind of hanging out. I don't know what that's about. <clears throat> Maybe it's a reference to Dante's Inferno. This is The Circus by George Surratt, the guy who did the dot, 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 dot. Sorry. Um, this is Young Girls at the Piano, Renoir. Renoir's stuff is very dreamy, very romantic. He loved kids. You could tell by looking at his paintings. Woman with a Birdcage, Rippy Ronald Joseph. That's a cool one. From Hungary. There were some cool paintings that came out from Hungary around this time, 1892, that had just these really interesting color palettes like this. Um, I'm thinking of Marianne. I'll look it up. I know her first name's Marianne. This is Kissing the Relic by Joaquin Sorolla, 1893. We're almost at the end. And here, uh, I believe it looks like they're doing communion. And everybody's lined up. You can see, look at the detail on the floor. That's amazing stuff. This is Storm Clouds by Carl Nordstrom. Eh. Oh, this is a fun one. The Sleeping Gypsy by Henry Rousseau. This is supposed to be full of symbolism, and I forget what all the symbolism is, but all of his stuff looks like this. He also painted the one with the lion peering out through the jungle, and it's the similar style, except there's a lot of green and stuff. This is Summer Night by Harold Solberg. I was going to say Germany. Norway. Norway. There's a certain quality to the skies in Norway, and there are some painters that are really able to kind of capture it, I feel like. And it looks like there was a very nice time that was had. Some people came out here. They sat at the table. 
They had a nice lunch. They snacked. They had some drinks. They laughed. But actually, there's only two benches. So maybe it's a husband and wife. And they've gone into the bedroom for a siesta. This is a Cezanne. Um, it's a cool piece, but I don't know. Never really did anything for me. Pennsylvania Station Excavation, George Wesley Bellows, 1907. So things start to get more real around this time in, as far as American art. And start, things start to get a little darker. And this is a commentary on industry. Gust Gustav Klimt, The Kiss. <clears throat> this painting is actually on my wall right there. I'm looking right at it. If I lean forward, I can touch the frame. I like this picture very much, this painting. Portrait of Pablo Picasso by Juan Gris. The Water Lilies by Monet. F also an artist that I didn't really like until I saw in person and I saw how meticulous he was in creating this fuzzy, like he created a fuzzy look, but he was so meticulous in how he did it. It's like, it's like the dot dot guy but I, I don't know how to explain it. You'll, you'll look at it and you'll blow it up and you'll be like, oh, okay, I see what she means. This is Hopper, Edward Hopper. This is Nighthawks, very famous. You see it in a lot of posters. There's some memes with it that are a lot of fun. In the next go around, I'll, I'll pull some of them and we can laugh at them together. Monastery, Ian Fairweather. Um, yeah, this was 1961. Art started mid-century art started to do this kind of stuff and in my opinion Klee who's not really mid-century art but he's kind of around that period is the only one who did it with any sort of eye appeal in my opinion I'm not I'm not an art critic I should have said that at, at the beginning I just like art this is a disturbing one interior with black rabbit I've never seen this before Ooh, we're gonna keep it moving and this is globe Hoffnung Lieb and I don't know if that's a painting or someone just stuck a freaking propeller on a piece of wood with paint. Could go either way. <clears throat> I'm going to go with piece of wood. We'll find out next time. So that is all of the art. I hope you enjoyed um, my musings on art. And I would encourage you to look at some art today. Do some stuff for your brain. Listen to some new music. Do some stuff for your brain. And I hope everyone has a good day. And until I see you guys again.